From the beginning, the images we have created have stood like mile markers on the road of human progress. What once was is now because artists made it so. They captured a moment and made it eternal. Where did they get such power? Well, it was given to them, passed down through the ages, mastered a student, each building upon the other. John Stobart, one of the most accomplished artists of our time, says, I don't think the greatest works have yet been done. And it's true that only if the secrets are given to yet another generation. The first secret is this. It is not in the hand, it is in the eye. Follow us and we'll show you that once you learn to look at the world differently, it becomes a different world, one in which nature becomes the greatest teacher of all. On Montserrat, the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean, nature creates some of the most dynamic cloud formations in the world. It's a perfect setting for John Stobart to teach us his technique for painting skies. Ever since being brought up in England and uh, going to school there, my favorite subject was geography. I love the, the idea that all the countries were trading together and learning about each other's ways of life. I think that is one of the, the biggest uh, pluses in the whole business of traveling, is to relate this to the geography that I knew as a young boy. Montserrat is located in the West Indies, which is a group of islands uh, that begin at the tip of Florida and go all the way to the southeast. The first few islands are Cuba, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico, which are the greater Antilles. The lesser Antilles are the string of islands that are the Leeward Islands and the Windward Islands that end up at Trinidad, which is next to Venezuela. Montserrat is between the Leeward and the Windwards, about 30 miles southwest of Antigua. It's a small island and a British dependency. Here we are in beautiful old town Montserrat with the, what I consider to be the epitome of the island right in front of us, the, the best view that we could find. Now, the mountain, which is Chances Peak, is right before us, and beyond that is the volcanic crater that uh, presumably was the way this island was formed. And this is a lovely view because it shows how the clouds form over the mountain and dissipate towards us. Now initially, I'm just going to daub around here and find out where I'm going and see whether the thing fits nicely onto the canvas and I'll change it as I go along. A lot of this is really what we were told uh, right in the early part of my art education, trial and error. You try, you try it this way and um, you make a an error and you correct the error. And uh, this is what painting really is all about you. You have to uh, be prepared to keep altering it. You can't do it right the first time. It's got to be, you just keep going and finally with perseverance, you get where you want to go. I first came to the West Indies in 1957 to Barbados. And since then seen probably eight of the islands um, this particular island, Montserrat, was named, in fact, by Christopher Columbus, who was sailing by and thought it reminded him of a, a monastery near Barcelona in Spain. It's funny how all the, the features of the islands in the West Indies are all, they've all got their own personality. And this particular one is uh, quite different from the others that I've been in. It's the job of every artist to try and make the character of the thing he's doing a little bit larger than life. And while I sit here and doing Montserrat, I'm trying to put all the, the characteristics that have come into my mind in traveling around the island 
into this one scene. One of the reasons that I chose Montserrat as a, a subject for this particular segment was the, the skies that I'd heard about that developed over the mountain and the, the topography of the island comes up into a mountain peak, uh, in two peaks actually, the volcano and another peak, and the clouds form over that and then dissipate. And I thought this would be an ideal place because there would always be clouds here and uh, this would be one place where we could really study that. I've always considered that the sky, in my particular instance, is the most important thing in the painting because it takes up the biggest area in the vast majority of paintings that I do. But in most of them, the sky is probably two-thirds of the painting. So I think it deserves two-thirds of the attention. I mean, I personally, uh, I, I love to put an explosion of light in the sky and, and make it a real feature of the painting rather than just a thing that sits there and does nothing. My skies have to work for me and they've got to work for the composition and make it live. Young artists and, and beginning painters should always, uh, always be aware of what's going on about them. They should always be looking for, for interesting skies and, and memorizing the the things that happen in skies. For example, one day I was driving on my way from Edgartown to Martha's Vineyard Airport, going west. The sun was fairly high in the sky still, and all the cloud bank above me was being lit from underneath, and I was so amazed by this that I just stopped the car and gazed at it for a while, wondered how on earth the sun was shining up into the clouds when actually the sun was above the clouds. Well, what was happening was that way off in the distance, 20 miles away, the sun was shining into vineyard sound and reflecting, the light was coming off the water and reflecting into it. Absolutely phenomenal experience. Now, I feel pretty comfortable about where I am with it at the moment. I've moved along and I've made all the decisions and passed the point of no return and know that I've got something really workable here. I'm getting towards putting the sky in a little while. What I'm going to do now is put some of these trees in that I think are the, that, uh, that turned me on to this thing in the first place. They were backlit this morning and uh, I'm going to put them in in the same way that they impressed me. What we're going to try and do is try and evoke the emotions that I felt when I first saw this scene. And I thought, whoa, look at that. Uh, this is Montserrat. And here is this wonderful mountain. One of the real fun things about uh, being an artist, of course, is that you can change something and put something into a painting that really isn't there. Here I have a, a landlocked landscape and I have the beach just off to my right and I was able to move the beach for, well, about 300 yards and this therefore now says more about Montserrat in one painting than it would have done if I'd have just done the one view. I've got two views in one. This little harbor here is, uh, of course, uh, is just really a bay. I've always had an attraction for harbors ever since uh, I first went to Liverpool to visit my maternal grandmother when I was only eight. And I came from Derby, which is right in the middle of England, and never seen a ship in my life, only seen pictures of them. When I saw this in Liverpool, uh, everything was there, big freighters, uh, ocean liners, uh, it was really, a revelation to me and I've always been fascinated by harbors ever since then. In initially searching for the, the characteristic which came to me as the most important thing that I wanted to portray about the island, 
of course, it was necessary to interrelate with a lot of the people and to go into the different areas of the island and look at the old sugar plantations and drive around the little villages and talk to people a little bit and, uh, and uh, just find out what their mood was and, and what sort of people they were. I mean, this is part, part of the, the fascination of coming to a, a, a sort of off the beaten track place like this. It's, it's just finding how other people live. One of the things that impresses, I, I would think, all people that come to this island is the friendliness of the people. It's a wonderful thing to be so well received and feel very comfortable talking to people. They always wave to you. Another surprise about the island was when I arrived at the airport, I got my passport stamped with a shamrock. And uh, I've discovered later that the, apparently the island was uh, originally populated by a group of Irish. And uh, apparently that heritage uh, can be traced uh, to the present day, even though the island has been uh, populated by all sorts of groups. But apparently this heritage still remains today. And this is why it's called the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean. 1962, you came home. Okay. I am a true out and out monstration, born here. In the daytime, the everything goes to a gray in the far distance. And as it comes towards you, the colors start to appear. And a bright red, for instance, right in front of me, will be gray on the horizon. You won't be able to see that. But halfway towards the horizon, you'd be able to tell it was red. And a quarter way towards me, or three quarters way towards me, it would be much redder. And you have to keep this in reserve all the time. As the colors recede towards the distance, they change. Yeah, this is a, what a wonderful day it is. Uh, the sun's shining, the smells are coming off the ocean. Uh, it's a terrific thing to be an artist and out in such a lovely place with tropical fruits and, uh, and lovely lush undergrowth around, warm winds, lovely temperatures. It's a heck of a lot better than, than being uh, back in a basement somewhere under artificial light uh, uh, trying to crank out something from a photograph. I mean, this is life. I think the message here really is that the, the aspiring artist, all he has to do to, or she, has to do to really experience some of the things that we're talking about here is, is just to get up and go out and try this. And uh, not be put off when they don't get on too quickly. Just go and try it and, and keep, don't give up. Just keep with it and you'll get all these wonderful experiences and enlarge your life. Now, in painting the sky, one should not use earth colors. This is burnt sienna, that's out. If I need any brown or, or to go to the warmth, I must make it up with these more ethereal colors. That is not uh, a color that I must use in the sky. This is for all the ground and darks that I'm going to use in the lower picture. The sky should be very, it's very delicate, and the colors are, uh, one has recession here, I want to make the distance look very good there. And the way to do that is to make the colors, the blue, gradually go into a gray as I have here. I've got the darker blue here and a grayish blue there. That's as dark as the blue that I need in this sky because I want the sky to look far away. Most people would, uh, when they start uh, painting, they think that all the clouds are white. This is not true, they're never white. They're always a little bit down from white. And here, I have the ground of the painting uh, that I originally put on that's still twinkling through some little spots here. You can see it all over the ground, and I want to leave some of that. But this is the ground color. And even that is almost right, and it's well down from white. Nothing is really white. Now, I'm just now trying to establish the darker part of the sky, which is right these points here. This will be lighter over here. Uh, the darker points are where the heaviness of the cloud buildup right over the mountain is. And ne next I'm going to dissipate the color across the, the bottom of the mountain and make that just a little lighter as I see it is. Basically I'm using 
red, yellow, and blue here. I haven't even touched this green. Uh, here again, it's a matter of making a gray, and one can warm it up or cool it off with the, the red and the yellow here, or cool it off with blue. It's the white and the blue and the red and yellow mixed in a certain way that creates these very subtle tones. The beginner should think of cross-hatching different colors. Don't just paint a gray, make a gray up. Pink and green make gray. Uh, there are several colors that make gray. Experiment with it and just slightly change it, not very much. You don't want bright pink and bright gray, but those sort of things the students should think about in, in just cross-hatching color and not just painting the thing like a door. Now, I'm making this, these clouds, they get thinner as they hit the mountain here, and um, this is beginning to look quite good. There's a little bit there coming down. And then it folds over the top and comes down again. Again, it's a delicate balance of playing around with the thing and finding your way through it by working from the cloud itself. Here's where the the answers are to my problems that I'm trying to work with are right in front of me, and I'm going to try and, and use this to the best advantage. Always looking at the thing itself to make sure that you get the feel of this. And this is where the spontaneity comes in, looking at it, and then, because you can't think this up, you've got to do it from the real thing. Now what I believe to be happening is that the wind is coming off the sea, which is way down the other side of the mountain, up the mountain, making the cloud, and as the wind comes this way, the clouds are, are hitting warmer air or whatever, and they're splitting off into little tiny clouds. And I'm trying to get a fluffy feeling here, and I think that's beginning to work. The purpose at this point, as I get down to more of the detail that I want to put in, is that I want to very carefully avoid uh, over-detailing it and getting into photorealism, which is just the opposite of what I'm trying to achieve. I'm trying to achieve the mood and, the, and get it down in a spontaneous way so that it looks like a painting and that it appeals in a certain way from the the brush strokes put on and the way the, the decisions have been made and the choices of uh, the colors and the emphasis. What I've got here is, I think, a nice feeling of the depth of these two chalets, taking the eye down to the beach and creating a valley up to the main subject. Now, I've been careful to have the darks in the foreground, and as we recede, they're getting slightly lighter. And as we recede back to the mountain, the mountain looks distant. You've got to create this sense of, of depth. We have nice contrast here with the dark cloud doing what I want. It's dissipating this way. And I'm going to put some little warm bits because as the as the white cloud goes to the distance, it gets warmer, and as it goes right into the distance, it'll come to a gray. But as it does that, it gets these nice pink tones. And if I can get a few of those under here, I'm all set. I think I've achieved what I want. The point of this whole series we're doing is to try and establish a pattern of the young person or the beginner going out and painting from nature
I don't want the beginning painter to uh, get caught up in the illusion that uh, is given us by uh, so many people that artists have to starve in a garret and you're perpetually worried about um, where the next uh, loaf of bread's coming. This is not true at all. If you go out there and try it, um, it's a terrific thing. And you, and you can have a lot of fun and give people a lot of pleasure. And once you get that little bug, you'll get a little bit excited. You'll never be able to give it up. What you have to remember is uh, the most crucial point that you need to have in your mind is that the, the whole business of painting is not just creating the painting or making money from it. It's a way of life that, uh, that brings you in touch with a whole new group of people and a whole spectrum of people. And you'll enjoy that. You'll, you'll broaden your horizon and you'll meet people and just enjoy life much more. And uh, this is what's happened to me. I'm absolutely fascinated by the people that I've met here. And uh, I hope the young artist will get out of his basement and uh, where it's artificially lit and go out into the real world and meet people and enjoy the discovery the same as I have. With every place that I paint, there are always certain memories that stand out above others. And in this particular case of Montserrat, I think the one thing that impressed me most was that wonderful fellow on a donkey who took his time out to talk to us and explain about himself and his island. He personified the proud and simple nature of the island. 